going to go over some stuff today. Last couple of weeks, we've really gotten into the his- history of uh, who we are as a people. We laid down one piece of evidence after another piece of evidence after another piece of evidence after another piece of evidence to show who we are as a people. Now, if I just come out and tell you that we are God's chosen people, we are the Hebrew people of the Bible, for the most part, that's just going to blow your mind because it did me. And I didn't accept it at first because I didn't realize the deception was as great as it was in the world. And so I had to start doing a little digging. And uh, the more I dug, the more revelation. And so it's amazing the the great deception that we are under uh, in the world and as, as a people. Uh, that old devil, he is, he is so slick. I mean, he's slicker than I thought he was. He is. And I'm going to show you some stuff today. It's going to blow your mind. It's going to challenge you. Some of it's going to excite you. Some of it's going to make you mad. Some of it's going to say, well, I don't know if I want to give that up. So, you know, it's just a lot of different things that you got to look at. I'm not here to judge anybody. I got my own issues and my own problems. I'm on my knees handling my stuff with him. I'm just giving you the information that you need to be able to make the choice. Because he's going to make us choose. Y'all get what I'm saying? We we, got to choose. This this, uh, this thing on one side of the fence, the other thing on the other side of the fence, lukewarm, however you want to call it. He's going to make us choose. So, at one point or another, so we left off last week, and I told you this week we're going to be talking about another Jesus. And I told you that some of us are worshiping another Jesus and don't even know. Now, that's messed up, man. That, that, that Satan is so slick that he can get us to worship something else. While we're thinking we're worshiping the true and the living God. But it's a trick. And I want to show you it's a trick and we're going to go over it and I'm telling you it's going to kind of throw you off a little bit. Some of it you've never heard. Some of it you have heard but not quite from this perspective. So let's move on. Now are you serving the right one? Before it's over with, and I'm I'm hoping I get all of this part done today. If not, we'll carry it on in the next week. That both Jesuses have a forerunner to announce their arrival. Okay? All right? Both Jesuses claim a miracle birth. Both Jesuses claim to be the Son of God. Uh, Both of them have what you call a 40 day fast. Uh, Both Jesuses have a resurrection. That's interesting. Uh, Both are part of a trinity, both have a church, and both promise eternal life. Are you serving the right Jesus? All right, in Revelations it says that, uh, he said, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, what does that mean? It said that Jesus himself has a testimony. Jesus himself has something that he uh, has that proves who he is. Y'all, y'all follow me? So Jesus has a testimony, and he says that his testimony is the spirit of prophecy. His testimony is telling you ahead of time what he's going to do, how he's going to do it, when he's going to do it, what day he's going to do it on, so that when he shows up and does it, it's no doubt that you are serving the true and the living God. See, for me... For me to follow him, he had to show me some stuff. Y'all, y'all get what I'm saying? I'm not easily convinced on anything. I'm a little hard-headed. My wife will tell you I'm a little hard-headed. My mom will tell you I'm a little hard-headed. But it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But, I mean, he had to show me. I said, Lord, if this is you, show me some stuff. And so he opened up my mind, and he showed me some stuff, right? All right, so uh, Amos tells us that surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants to private. So he said, I'm not going to do anything. Y'all, y'all catch that, man. I'm not going to do anything unless I tell it to my servants to private. So there's not one thing that, that he's doing or, or, or he's going to do that he hadn't told us through somebody. Now, if I don't, now, if I don't read the book, if I don't pray and I don't say, it's not his fault because he told somebody. 
That's all, that's all I'm saying. So he told us, we just got to search this thing out, right? Okay. All right. So and then in John, he said, for there are three. He said, you got witnesses. He didn't just say he did it. He got witnesses that he did it. And he said, there are three uh, that bear record in heaven. He said, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then he said, that's in heaven. And he said, on earth, I got three more witnesses. He said, that's the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these agree in one. So he's got witness. Out of the mouth of two or three. But he said, let it be established, right? All right. So when we look at this, he said, okay, well, what did he do? And he wrote it down before he came. That's what Psalm 46 through 8, but I said, Sacrifices and offerings thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Now, this is talking about Jesus. Jesus is prophesying about himself. He said, I wrote it in the book. Everything that I'm going to do, I wrote it in a book. And he confirms that in Hebrews that Psalms 40 was talking about him. So before I come, I'm going to write it in a book. All right? So we know now that the book is about Yeshua, Jesus. The whole book. The whole book you got is talking about him. Even the things that you didn't know were talking about him are talking about him. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. He said, in Luke, he said, then he said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe. This is after his resurrection. All that the prophets have spoken ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So this was the res- after the resurrection. And he's talking about, he went and explained to these men walking down the road all the things concerning himself. But there was no New Testament. Right? There was no New Testament. So what book did he go back to? He went to the Old Testament to explain himself. There was no Mark, Luke, John at that time. So then the Old Testament then is talking about? Okay. Okay. I just wanted to get that. Then he went to his disciples and he told them the same thing. He said, these are the words that I've spoken to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So now we know that the law of Moses was his first five books of the Bible. And the prophets, which is Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Obadiah, Nahum, all those guys. And the Psalms, which is Proverbs, Psalms, Song of Psalms. Which is the entirety of the whole testament. It's talking about him. That's powerful, ain't it? And then he gives us another clue, and he said, he opened up their understanding. When you seek him, he opens up your understanding. But he said he is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently, what? Seek him. I can't seek after something else and get revelation from God. I got some friends caught up right now, y'all. They're trying to seek knowledge to get to God. Now, you got to get to God. And he gives you knowledge. All right. Revelation. He said, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals? Now, this is the book I'm talking about that he wrote before he came. He wrote the book and he put the king's seal on the book. This is what this is talking about. Now, when you study the king's seal, nobody can take the king's seal off but an authorized agent of the king. It was punishable by death if you put a seal on anything and somebody else took it off, you, 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 you're going to die. If you were a messenger and, you, and they put a seal on a book and you were supposed to transport that, that thing to the next man or the next woman and then when it got there, if the seal was broken, you might as well not even show up because you're going to die. It's king seal. And so in Revelations we see that, that, that the lamb is sitting on his throne and we are all gathered around the throne and, and they come out and the father holds up a book and the angel proclaims to who is worthy to open this book. Now we're all standing there, right? None of us will be able to say anything because none of us are worthy. 
I just, this is the premise of the gospel. None of us are, are worthy. You know, uh, you might have slept with five women. I slept with 50, but neither one of us worthy. All it takes is but one thing to make you unworthy. So we need to, we need to understand that. All right. And so now he's saying, who is worthy? So everybody in heaven looks around because we all have one thing in common. None of us are worthy. And John begins to cry because he doesn't see anybody who is worthy to open the book. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four elders, I mean four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So Jesus stands up and he still has the wounds in his hands. Y'all got it. And he still has the wounds in his feet and the piercing in his side. And he stands up and he goes over to the Father and grabs the book because he's the only one that is worthy to open up the book. The same book that he wrote before he came down. Okay, so I want us to see that image of what we're dealing with here. He's an almighty, awesome, all-knowing, omnipotent, you-can-depend-on-him type God. If he can write everything down in a book and seal it up before he came, and then when he go back and open the book back up, show you he wrote it down before he got here. That's a bad boy right there. Listen, if you're going to follow somebody, that's the type of God you need to follow right there, right? He's going to tell you ahead of time. That's why he said his testimony then is what? The spirit of the prophets. Can't, can't no other God do it. Buddha can't do it, y'all. Can't do it. Uh, Confucius can't do it. Muhammad, he can't do it. But the God we serve can do it. All right? Let's look at this first thing then, the prophecy of Adam. Let's start at the beginning. The prophecy of Adam. I never heard of the prophecy of Adam. Well, Romans 5, 14, 15 tells me that Adam is a prophecy. It said, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even unto them that had not sinned out of the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Wait a minute, he just told me that Adam is a picture of Christ. Adam is all the way back in Genesis. And he was talking about himself through Adam in Genesis. That's pretty good, ain't it? That's pretty good. Now, why is he doing it? So that when we get out into the world, we begin to search after him. We begin to look for him. Who is the real God? Because there's some strong delusions out here, I'm telling you. Some strong, can I count on me? Is, is it just because mom and them told me about Jesus? Is it just... Is it because daddy them said it? Or is it because, uh, you know, church folks, I love the church folks because they said it? Or is it because he proved himself? That's why I follow him because I, I got to a point I said, Lord, there's got to be more to this than what I'm being told. This is not, this ain't making no sense to me. I, I believe you, but Lord, help thine mind unbelief. Y'all with me? All right. So he said that Adam is a picture of Christ. Well, let's look at this. In Genesis 2 and 21, it says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh there. All right? In Daniel, that word sleep, we can see, can also figuratively mean to die. So, in order for Adam to bring forth his bride, he figuratively died. What did Christ do in order to bring forth the church? He died. That's powerful, ain't it? Just that right there. He just, that's powerful. We ain't done yet. Watch this. So, in that same scripture, it said that he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh and instead of the other. So, Adam was wounded. Y'all see that? <coughs> so, you go to John and it says, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his leg, but one soldier with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Not only was he wounded, but he was pierced. So, let's look at these two things. So, Adam was put to sleep, 
in order to bring forth his bride. And he was wounded in the process. And the inference is that he shed blood. I just want you to see this. This is all in Adam. This is right there in the book of Genesis, okay? It's going to start making sense in a minute. Now, watch this. It says, now, Adam died on the sixth day of the week. Well, how do we know it's the sixth day of the week? Because that's when he created Adam. God hadn't rested yet. He didn't rest until the seventh day. So he created him on the sixth day. And that's when Adam died. What day did Christ die on? You say, you got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The sixth day of the week. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. What else can we look at? Adam and Eve, the reunification. In order for God to bring the woman out, he had to split Adam. Adam was all one. And then God split him. And he put one characteristic of man in the woman, and he left some characteristic of the man in the man. And he said, the only way y'all going to get along because y'all are so different is with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> y'all don't believe that, dude. Y'all don't believe that. Mm, that's real right there. Let all the married folks say amen. amen. All right. <laughs> hey, we just think different. We're different. We, we, you know, our, our logic is different. We, we think one way. Women think another way. It's just the way it is. It's not a bad thing. It just is what it is. And so in order for us to walk together, he said, how can two walk together unless they agree? And ain't but one thing you can agree on, and that's that God is God. Y'all get what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm telling you, if you don't come together in that, you, you might as well. You, you, if you don't agree, then what he calls it, he said, you know, you have two visions. And when you have two visions, you have what, what they call division. Y'all, y'all didn't see that. It's two visions, two different directions. Because I'm thinking one thing and she's thinking another thing. But the Lord said, but if you're coming to the word and think the same thing I think, you can get along. You can get along. Uh, you got to let stuff go sometimes. Even right, you got to let it go sometimes. Y'all get what I'm saying? Because that's what he did, right? I was wrong, but he let it go on me. And so if I got his character in me, then I'm going to be able to let some stuff go on you, right? All right, I'm just saying, that's what he's saying. So he brought them back together. He split them up, and he said, A man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Well, what happened when we got married to Christ? Let's look in the Ephesians. He said, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of what? His body, of his flesh, and what? Of his bone. So he said, the same picture that I drew in Adam and Eve about the reunification is the same picture that I want you to understand between me and you. We're coming back together, but we couldn't do it until I gave you my spirit. Because how can two walk together? Lest they be agreed. All right. Adam willingly sinned for Eve. According to 1 Timothy, for Adam was first formed in Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So Adam was not deceived. He willingly do it. He had, he, before Eve was taken out of Adam, he had made a covenant with God. He said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve wasn't even pulled out yet. She didn't hear that. The covenant was with Adam and not with Eve. All right? He knowingly took sin on for his bride. What did Jesus do? Did he knowingly take on our sin? Why? Because he loved us. See, he who knew no sin became sin. He said, no man take my life, I lay it down. <laughs> and if I lay it down, he said, I'm going to come back. So we see he willingly did this thing. Adam was naked and ashamed. After he ate, he realized that he was naked. And he tried to go get some fig leaves. Cover that thing up. Because he knew, he knew God was coming. Because Jesus came down and communed with them in a specific place. 
and he knew he was coming, and maybe if I cover myself up with these fig leaves, this dead thing, maybe he won't realize that all my glory gone. Y'all know church folks like that? You know, we get real holy when we come in the building, don't we? Boy, I tell you, and then we leave and do some everything. And then we come back and we dress up real good, put our fig leaves back on, and we go right back out. And there's always somebody else. It ain't never me. Look at what those people are doing over there. Which, in, 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 as we'll see, is the beginning of the first false religion. I can cover my own sins. I can put my fig leaves on and maybe don't want nobody to notice that I got issues and shortcomings. Maybe they won't notice my bad temper. Maybe they won't notice that I do have a lust problem. Maybe they, they won't realize that I, that I overeat and, and, and do all these things that are, are shortcomings. Maybe they won't realize. Maybe if I shout loud enough in church and I sing enough songs in church, maybe if I do all these things, people won't realize that I got some serious issues. You know, I'm on this board, and I'm on that board, and I'm the elder, and, and I'm the deacon, and, and I'm a pastor, and I'm a this, and I'm a mother. But, but, but maybe my title will hide. Yeah, I'm going to leave that alone. So we hide in the church. We hide in the church. I'm going to show you in a minute why you don't have to hide. All right? So was Adam naked and ashamed? So that means that Jesus was naked on the cross, and he had shame on him too. But he fought off that shame. Why? Because he knew that his shame would bring us back into the fold. And it said that looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He despised it. He pushed it to the side. So Adam was naked and ashamed. Jesus was naked and ashamed. All right? Adam's restoration... Okay, what did God do when he came down and he saw that they were naked? He killed some animals. And he took the skins of the animals. And he covered Adam and Eve up in the bloody skins of those animals. And he executed judgment on the animal. The animal died. Now, I just want you to see the picture here because this is a picture that follows us all throughout scripture. The animal didn't do anything. Adam and Eve did something. But God killed the innocent thing, took the skins off the innocent thing, and wrapped the guilty thing up in the innocent. Y'all see that? I just want you to see it. This, this, is the, this is the crux of the gospel. This, is, this, this right here is a theme all the way through our gospel. It's a theme that, that says, I can't work for my salvation. It's a thing that says my righteousness doesn't come from my own works. It, 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 it doesn't. I can't be innocent because of what I do. It, it, it's something else has to stand in my place. And so God took these animals and killed them, wrapped them up in, in the skins of the animals, executed judgment on the animal as if the animal had eaten of the fruit. And then he let Adam and Eve walk away with the skins of the animals on as if they had done nothing wrong. That's the gospel. That's righteousness, y'all. You ask church folks, I've been to different places and teaching. First question I like to ask sometimes, are you right? Because they're thinking about what they've done. And if you're thinking about what you've done, no, you're not righteous. You're no good. I'm no good. None of us are any good. We're all in the same boat. But what he did, the Lamb of God came along. What did he do? He took all of my sins upon himself. And he was executed as if he was me. And he took his skins off himself, his righteousness. The scripture calls it a robe of righteousness. And he put it on me. So now when he looks at me, the father sees the covering of his son on me, the lamb. And when he looked at his son, he saw the judgment that I deserved. All that right there prophesied in Adam. He said, how, God, then will you restore men? He said, he said with, with men this is impossible, but with, 
with God. Oh, the, it, 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 it's easier for a rich man to go through the a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom. But well, that's that's impossible. He said, "That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's impossible with you." But the way I'm going to do this thing, all things. All right. That makes sense? All right. Adam 6, 61 and 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Y'all see that? He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So you are covered not in your own righteousness when you accept Christ. You are covered in his righteousness. And there's nothing that you can do to enter into the kingdom on your own. Either you go in this way, admitting that you're no good and he did it all, or you don't go in at all. That's why when new people come to church, you ain't got to worry about what you being. What you did. We all been. We all did. Come on, y'all. That's the real church. I'm going to show y'all the, the other Jesus say something different. <laughs> I'll tell y'all, this thing right here is the thing that goes all the way throughout Scripture. And if you change it, he says, somebody's going to come along preaching another gospel. Can't change that. He established that in the book of Genesis. I got a substitute for you. I was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. I got this thing covered. You accept my plan and you cover. Okay, I just want you to see it. I want to drill that down because you can't leave the, the, the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? So prophetically, what did we learn from Adam about Jesus' testimony? Jesus would die to bring forth his bride. This is what Adam told us. That Jesus and his bride would be what? One body. That Jesus would be wounded. That Jesus' wound would be by piercing. That Jesus would die on the sixth day of the week. That Jesus would be res resurrected on the first day of the week. Okay, I didn't cover that one, but I get that. Jesus would be naked and face shame during his fall. Jesus would fall willingly for his bride. And Jesus would provide the path to righteousness through substitution. So that's what we learned through prophecy and Adam. Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, I didn't cover that first day on a slide. Um, but the first day of the week, you remember when God created Adam and uh, Eve, it was the sixth day. And so then God rested. So that was the seventh day. Then they ate of the fruit, and God didn't rest anymore. So the next day started. And so that's when he took the animals and killed them and covered them up. And so it was the first day of the week. So he was announcing that the restoration of man would happen on the first day of the week. What day of the week was it when Yeshua got up? It's the first day of the week. All right. all right. In Revelation, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose name are not written in the book of the life, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So he had this plan uh, to be slain from the foundation. But then he goes back to the Old Testament and he explains the lamb all the way from the beginning, all the way until he comes back. And so I'm going to go through this with you and show you that he's the true and the living lamb of God. Because every time he mentions the lamb in the Old Testament, he's really talking about himself. The scripture says, if Satan had known the plan of God, he would never have crucified the Lord. He didn't know because he didn't have the, the access to the Holy Spirit to know that the lamb in the Old Testament was a picture of what Christ was going to be doing when he came. Had he known that, he would never have crucified the Lord. All right, so let's go through this. All right, let's, Genesis 22 is the first place where he talks about the lamb specifically. In Genesis, with, with Adam, he doesn't name a particular animal. He just says his coats... <coughs> A mini animal. The skins of mini animals. All right. But in Genesis 22, let's take a look at this. This is another prophecy. Y'all remember, you know, he always says, I'm the God of Abraham, what? Isaac and Jacob. Okay. And so really, that was a coded message for I am the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. With that in mind, let's look at this. 
In Genesis 22, he said, and he said, take thy son, thy only son. That's a play on words right there. He's letting you know now, Genesis 22, that it was going to be his only begotten son that was going to come and save the world. So he's adding more information to us as we study. So we got all of the details from Adam and now from Genesis 22 and 2, which is a picture. And then he tells him in John, he said, and this was manifested, the love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten son. And you say, well, I thought Abraham had another son, Ishmael. No, Abram had a son named Ishmael. But after his name changed, he only had one son. So Isaac was the son of promise that came after the change. So as Abraham, he only had one son. All right? And that's another thing, too, you got to look at. Abraham, when he got Ishmael, he was doing it because he was trying to do his own work. See, there's other religion that keeps him. Tell y'all, he was trying to do his own work, and he knew God had made him a promise, but it wasn't coming fast enough. And so, uh, you know, well, maybe God meant that I can, uh, 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 you know, have it by my handmaid. And so he went in and he slept with Hagar, which was not of God for him to do. And he had, uh, you know, Ishmael out of that relationship. But that was not the son of promise. And I often look at my own life, and I wonder how many Ishmaels I got running around doing things, trying to make things happen that only God can make happen. All right, so that's one thing. He, he's prophesying here, the only begotten son. And then he says, take him into the land of Moriah. So is that a prophecy? Well, absolutely, because Moriah is in Jerusalem. So now we got the son the only begotten son who is going to be taken into Jerusalem. Just like Jesus was in Jerusalem. That's the place of the crucifixion. Everybody knows it's Jerusalem, all right? Then he said, he said, when you get there, I want, I want you to offer him up for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell the other. So it was a specific mountain that he took him up. And as you study, you realize that the same mountain range that Abraham took Isaac on was the same mountain range that Jesus was taking on. All right? Was, was Jesus an offering? In Isaiah 53, it said, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. So here we got Isaac that was... It was, it was a picture because he was, he was going to be an offering. And then you got Jesus, the son, coming to be an offering for us. All right. And he said, Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. All right. Well, how did Jesus ride in? It said, the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the coat and put them on their clothes and they set him thereon. So you got Abraham riding and Isaac riding in on an ass. Into the place of crucifixion. And you got Jesus riding into Jerusalem, the place of crucifixion on an hand. Do y'all see the prophecy here? I just want you to see this prophecy. So there's more to this than what we look at. So then he said, Abraham took two of his young men with him. And I, so when you go to the cross, the place of the crucifixion, you see Jesus and two men. He's talking to us, y'all. He just wants us to open up our minds to this thing. I'm bigger than what you think I am. I'm more structured than who, uh, what you think I am. I'm giving you more than what you think I am. I want you to know exactly the God that you serve. And he never changes his story. He simply adds more detail for clarification on certain things. But his story is always the same. All right. All right, and then on the third day, see now they throw the third day. Now everybody knows about the third day, all right? You know Jesus always talks about rising again. What on the third day? Well, you say, well, he wasn't really he he wasn't really raised up on the third day. But you got to understand that in Abraham's mind, for three days his son was dead to him. He was going to, have to kill his son. 
But his mindset was, when I get him up there and I kill him, he said, because God made a promise through this son. See, now you got to go backwards and you got to say, you got to go backwards because he told me when this boy was going to be born, that out of this boy was going to come nations and a seed that was going to save the whole world. And he's made a promise to me. So I got two choices, either God lying because I got to kill him now or he's going to raise him back up again. Oh, y'all got to see this. So he was expecting he was expecting God to, uh, uh, to raise, if he killed him, God was going to raise his son back up again. Yeah. Now, that's in the book. Look at the Hebrew. He said, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So you got to see, he's a, he's, he's a seed of promise. And so now I got to kill him. He said, but he was accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. Listen, this is what he's saying. He said, this was a shadow. Only reason I told Abraham to do that was, number one, I wanted to show how faithful he was. Number two, I wanted to show what my son was going to do and how I was going to offer my only son and how he was going to be raised up on the third. That was the purpose. And then Isaac was uh, uh, in his 30s. So we always think of him being a little Isaac was in his 30s, a wrong man. He could have fought Abraham off. He said, man, I ain't going up there. But because he trusted his father, he trusted him even unto death. And Jesus trusted his father too. All the way to the cross. All through the beatings. Down in the pits of hell. Because you know he had to go so we wouldn't go. He trusted his father. Now, that's some faith ain't it? Alright. And so in Luke 18 it says. And the third day he shall rise again. Alright. Genesis 22 again. The wood. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. And laid it up on Isaac his son. Okay. So they're walking up the same mountain range that Jesus was going to walk up. And now Abraham, the father, puts wood on his son's back to go up the same mountain range that 2,000 years later, Jesus will walk up. And you see Jesus walking up the mountain range, and he's got wood on his back. We call it the cross, but it was, it was wood his back because he was instructed by his father to go up the hill. So now he's prophesying to us through Isaac that when you see the one that's got wood on his back, that's the one. All right? Along with all the other things we have just learned, okay? All right? So we saw in John 19, he said, he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull. All right? And Abraham said, my, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Now, see, this is something that Isaac understood. Isaac was willing to die because he believed his father. But he also understood the concept that he couldn't die for his own sin or anybody else's sin. This understanding prompted him to ask his father, where is the lamb? I'm willing to die. But you know, I can't die with my own righteousness because my righteousness is as a filthy rag. I've got to have a substitute in there somewhere. So every other time that we've sacrificed, we've understood that now I'm willing to die, but I can't be my own sacrifice. Where's the lamb? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself. Yes. Y'all got to, see, see when you read that, that's a play on word. He said he's gonna provide himself as a lamb. Y'all get that? And then we see two thousand years later, John the Baptist is baptizing people. He looks up and he sees it, he recognizes it, and he says, Behold the lamb. The same lamb. 
that Abraham had prophesied about 2,000 years before he came. John the Baptist is there, the forerunner, to introduce. I mean, because every king got to have somebody introduce him. You, you just don't walk into a room if you're a king. You want to be able to introduce the king so everybody can get ready for the king. Y'all get what I'm saying? You don't want the king to just show up on you. You want to know the king is coming so you can clean the carpet and get everything together, put my best clothes on. The king is coming. And so he sends a forerunner to warn you that the king is coming. And he's telling us today, y'all, that the king is coming. But we ain't listening. All right. Then look at this. This is the crown. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he didn't see a lamb. Because the lamb was a prophecy. He saw a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Now when you look up the word horns in the Hebrew, it means power. So his power was caught up in a thicket. Well, what was a thicket? A thicket was intertwined branches. Like a crown that they made. They they plaited it. It was a, so, so a thicket is a plaited wood. And the, and the ram, which is also a picture of Christ, head, both his horns, was surrounded by a crown. Y'all didn't see that. So he was prophesying that when you see the true Messiah come, you're going to see his power being depleted. And you're going to see his head wrapped in a crown of thorns. And you see in Matthew, that happened, right? And he said, when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and the reed in his right hand, they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, Jesus, King of the Jews. So he's prophesying about the crown that he would have on his head. All right, so prophetically, what did we learn from Abraham about Jesus' testimony? We learned that Jesus would be considered an only son, that Jesus would be led into Jerusalem, that Jesus would become a burnt offering, that Jesus would ride to Jerusalem on an ass, that there would be two men with Jesus, Jesus would be resurrected on the third day, and would, uh, wood would be laid on Jesus' back, and Jesus would be the lamb, and Jesus would be crowned with plaited wood. All right? So you can put that in the bank, because he already wrote it. He put it down, and I didn't get everything in there. I'm just trying to give you a picture, because he wants you to seek some of this stuff out. Right? And he'll give you revelation. So we learn from Adam. We, we got some things we learned from Adam about when we see him, these are the things that he has to accomplish. We saw some things now through Genesis 22 that when we see him, these are some of the things he has to accomplish because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right. Y'all with me? All right. All right. Well, what about the next thing? He tells us when he's going to do it. This is the real Jesus. I'm just showing y'all who the real Jesus is. Then I'm going to show you who the fake Jesus is. And then I'm going to show you that many of us, including myself, have worshipped unknowingly another Jesus. Hmm. All right. So Genesis 1 and 4, when we see it, he said, God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And so when you look up the word signs, it means signals. And when you look at the word season, it means the same Hebrew word that they use for feast. And it means an appointed time. So he said, that, he said, let them be then for signals and appointed times. All right? So put that in your memory bank. Let's move forward. In Leviticus 23, he gives certain days that he wants us to celebrate. Why? Because he said these are the feasts of the Jews. Oh, okay. These are the feasts of the Hebrew people? No. These are the feasts of church folk. These are the feasts of Yahweh the Lord. This is his stuff. That's all I want you to see. This is his. And he gives it to us to celebrate. He says, holy convocations. He said, as a sacred assembly of coming together, he said, I want you to see that when I gather you together, I'm going to do it on these days. 
And men of Israel were required three times a year to go back to Jerusalem on one of those uh, feast days, one in the spring, one in the summer, and one in the fall. They had to be there for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They had to be there for Pentecost, and they had to be there for the Feast of Tabernacles. Had to be there. No matter where you were, if you were in Babylon, you go back to Jerusalem and celebrate these feasts. This is important. Because when I do come, this is the day I'm coming on to do what I'm going to do, and I need you to be present to win. Y'all ever had one of those lottery things you had to be, you had to be present to win? If you, you can have the ticket, but if you're not there, it's a forfeiture. And some of us are not there. We're not. We got a ticket. But this Saturday stuff, 10 to 12 every Saturday in February, that's too much. All right. So these are the spring feasts. I'm not going to go over all of them. I'm just going to deal with the Passover so that we can make our point and then we'll move on. All right. This is what he told them to do. He said, prophecy number one, he said, I want you to take a lamb from each household according to the fathers, and I want you to hold that lamb from the 10th of Nisan to the 14th of Nisan. This is, this is the, he gave them specific days that they had to do. And so when Jesus came, he came, he was held for four days, 4,000 years. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. He was held for four days because he was a lamb slain from the foundation. So he was a lamb from the foundation, right? So he was being held from the foundation, from the beginning. So four days later, 4,000 years, he shows up on the scene. So he was held for four days. Now on earth, he did the same thing. He rides in on the donkey on the 10th of Nisan. He goes into his father's house, fulfilling this prophecy. And you see him either in his father's house preaching or you see him in Simon the leper's house on the fourth day. Four days he was in the house. All right. And the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy foot. So stay here for four days until I send you out and I make thine enemies thy foot. And Peter warns him, he said, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. This is important. All right. Uh, event number two. The lamb was inspected over four days and could not be found with spot or blemish. So the lamb, the four days was for inspection. And for your family had to get a lamb inspected. And you would take the lamb and, the, and you would inspect it and then the priest would inspect it before it was killed. And if there was anything wrong with the lamb, it could be used as an offering. Because now you're taking something bad and trying to make it cover up for something that's bad. It's like taking an a oil the rag with oil on it and cleaning the coffee table off. All you can do is take something that's already dirty and, and smear dirt on something that's already dirty. The lamb was the substitute for the person and the family. It had to be clean. Y'all go back to Adam. Y'all go back. He took the innocent animals and he covered them with the skins of the innocent animal and he executed judgment on the animal. This is what was going on with the Passover lamb. It had to be without spot, without blemish. All right, so Jesus was inspected by Pontius Pilate, Herod, the high priest, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the blood, the water, the spirit, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. He was inspected. There was no fault. He was lamb. Okay? It was supposed to be kept until the 14th of Nisan, and the whole congregation was to kill it. I mean, everybody was responsible for the death of the lamb. There's not one person who could escape the fact that they were just as responsible for the death of the lamb as his brother was. In other words, you're all guilty. We're all as responsible for the death of Jesus as the next person. Because he loved all of us. And he died for all of us. 
And it took him, it don't matter if you did 10 things and I did one, he had to die for my one, just like he had to die for your 10, because in order to get into the presence of God, you gotta be perfect. You can't be perfect on your own. You need a substitute to make you perfect. Y'all get what I'm saying? We would get a whole better, a whole lot better in the church if we understood we were all guilty. We would. And we, would, we wouldn't point to people so quickly because we're all guilty. And the same blood that it took to wash mine is the same blood that it takes to wash yours. The same blood that it took to wash my little bitty stuff it's the same blood that it's going to take to wash the prostitute, the drug dealer, the liar, the cheat. And we all have a title. We just don't tell nobody. Y'all remember in the Bible? We got all got a title. You had Simon the leper. Y'all, come on. We all got a title. Y'all don't want to tell nobody y'all title, but you got it. All right. So that should call us all to be humble. Yes. Ephesians said we've all had our conversation with Satan in time past. Yes. We all sit down at the table with Satan at some point and feast it. Yes. All right. So he was kept. He was inspected. There was nothing found wrong with him because he was the Passover lamb. All right. Then the lamb was to be slain between the evenings, which means around three o'clock. Jesus died, the true lamb, at three o'clock. He died at the ninth hour of the day. So just like the lamb prophesied in the Old Testament, he was going to die at three. Jesus came along and died at three. This is what I'm telling you. He performed his appointment. He does exactly what he said he's going to do, when he said he's going to do it, because his testimony is the spirit of prophecy. All right? So, he was kept until the 14th of Nisan, and the whole congregation was to kill it. Jesus was kept until the 14th of Nisan, and, and the whole congregation killed it on Passover. All right? The lamb was to be placed on a stick and roasted Outside the camp. And then the stick was placed inside the breastplate to keep it open. Jesus the Lamb was placed on the pole, having fulfilled the law. Y'all see that? Y'all see the cross in that? Okay. This is how they would do it. This is how they would do the Lamb. And then when the real Lamb came, he was on a stick just like that. And Hebrews said he was placed outside the gates. Outside the camp. Just like he had prophesied 1,500 years before he came. Are you serving the right one? All right. Then he said the doorpost would be struck with three spots with the blood of the lamb. And then there was a basin at the door, and the stripes were in the form of a cross. So now I see three crosses on the doorpost. And when you go to Calvary Hill, how many crosses do you see? All right. Each spot represented a wound where the head was, where his hands were, and then at the bottom where the basin, where he was bleeding, his feet. And the blood was applied with a plant called hyssop. It was a plant used for healing. So his whole purpose of, of, of applying the blood to our lives is for our what? Our healing. Okay? So then when Jesus goes to the cross, they come up to him with what? Some hyssop. Because he's the true lamb. So they apply blood on this lamb, and then they came to Jesus to apply blood, I mean the hyssop, to the true lamb. All right, so he's fulfilling prophecy. Then the lamb was to be eaten with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread in the scripture means no sin. So Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. All right. Now this is the bread. This matzah bread is also a picture. It has no leaven in it. It's, it's plain. 
uh, the matzah is per- perforated, is pierced, is bruised, and they called it in the Old Testament, or uh, the ancient Hebrews called it the bread of affliction. And they didn't know anything about Christ. They didn't know they were prophesying about Christ. That the bread that they used for Passover was pierced, it was bruised, and it was called the bread of affliction. So Jesus comes along. He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. I was born in Bethlehem, which is, is by definition called the house of bread. So the bread came down from heaven and was born in a place named the house of bread. The same bread was pierced and striped and bruised and suffered affliction. Come on, y'all. Yeah. That's some amazing stuff to me. That's the God we serve. That's all I'm saying. That's the real Jesus. That's the real Jesus. That's the real Jesus, okay? All right, this is a picture of the bread. It's bruised, it's pierced, it's striped. And I had some and I forgot to bring it. I was trying to do too much. It's called matzo bread. All right. Then first fruits. So he died on Passover. He was in the grave on unleavened bread, and he was resurrected on first fruits. Okay. So he was resurrected on first fruits, and I'm gonna take a five minute break. Change the tape out. All right, first fruits. This is what they would do. They would go out into the field because it was harvest time, and they would go to the field and they would get a sample. They wouldn't harvest the whole field. It wasn't time for the harvest the whole field because we got to check and make sure that the sample is all right. And so they would take a sample from the field and bring it to the high priest. And the high priest would inspect the sample. I don't know if anybody ever worked in a factory or in a lab or whatever. You don't take all the material to the lab to get it checked out. All you do is take a sample because the sample is an indication, should be, of the whole thing. And when he said that, if the sample was okay, that meant that the whole field is all right. All right? So this is, this is what happened on first fruit. This was, okay? Jesus just considered our first fruit. He said, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. So what is he saying? He said, I had to go into the heavens and be inspected to make sure that the first fruit was good. Y'all see. And so when he got up, y'all remember he told Mary, he said, don't, don't touch me. For I have not yet ascended to my father. But he comes back later on and he tells the disciples to handle me. That tells me something. He had ascended. So when he got up, she couldn't touch him. Because he hadn't ascended. Later on, he ascended, came back down because he was accepted as the first fruit. And if he was accepted as the first fruit, he said, now I'm getting ready for my harvest. And if the first fruit is all right, my whole harvest. See, y'all worried about your salvation. I'm not. If he good and you've accepted what he's done, that means you're good. The whole. Is okay. So now it's not about it's now it's about going out and, and, and picking up the harvest. And telling people, you know, you good. If you accept this, you good. Come on in. You good? Do you accept this? Yeah, you good. And so he just makes a harvest. He said, Man, the harvest is plentiful. But we ain't got nobody to go out and get it. All right. So he's our first fruit. So that's what first fruits mean. That means I don't have to be inspected by the Father. Jesus was inspected. He's good. Not only was he the lamb that had to be inspected, he was also the high priest. And we'll talk about that in another session, another session. Then they would count for 50 days, and then they would celebrate what you call Pentecost. They did this in the wilderness. And uh, I'll pick it up right here. I'm going to go ahead and get this changed out. Five minutes.